Spending many a years in Nigeria, which is very, very hot. I know one of the tricks of surviving the heat is that you minimize movement. So I encourage you as you sit down to just, if you're not feeling, don't worry, I know you're feeling the Holy Spirit. You don't need to jump up and down and wave your hands and everything in this uh, heat. I know you're hearing God's word. It's okay. There's, there's grace there. Uh, my name's Daniel Sheshi. I'm one of the co-teaching pastors here at Tapestry Church. We have a bunch of new faces, and it is a blessing to see so many new faces. Faces, many of which I've been able to already connect with. I want to invite you again to this church. Happy to have you. We have our elders that are here and we have our wonderful members that are here to love God and to serve each other and to live out the gospel in our community faithfully. And so we are very excited to have you here. And if you will, feel encouraged at the back, there is an opportunity to kind of give us your information, your contact details. And we as a leadership team would love to get in touch with you as soon as possible. Anyway, for those of you who know and for those of you who don't, this summer we've been going through wisdom literature in the Bible. And we've gone through Proverbs and now we are going through Ecclesiastes. We only have three Sundays in Ecclesiastes, so our journey is very brief, but as bird's eye view as possible as we can go. Last week, Pastor Jared preached and gave a general summary of how we should approach the book of Ecclesiastes. I am going to be preaching from Ecclesiastes verse Chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. And the title of my message this morning is very simple. It's Fear God. So if you will, open up your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1. And I will begin reading from verse 1 all the way to verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. And I'll read the word of God in our hearing. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, For a dream dream comes with much busyness, and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the works of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. I'm going to say that last verse again for emphasis. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one that you must fear. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, this opportunity to gather together as your believers, to dive into your word and to hear what you are saying to your people. It's been a week for many of us in both positive and negative ways, and I'm sure it will be a week for many of us ahead in positive and negative ways. And so, Lord, we come here seeking to hear a word from you, not from me, but from your word to encourage us, to exhort us, and to help us live lives on mission for your glory in the days, weeks, and months, and years ahead. We pray that your word will pierce our hearts, convict us of our sins, and encourage us of your, in the ways that you have blessed us and continue to bless us, that you will galvanize us as a community to live God-consciously and speak and worship in all this matters to you. We love you, Lord, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You know, in general, in Christianity, our faith, in our journey, there are a myriad of instructions that we have, like different words, different phrases, different instructions that we're given that are very good, but when you try and apply it, you realize, man, the meaning and the application of that phrase is so much. For example, loving your spouse well. Okay. I should love my spouse well, but what does loving my spouse particularly look like? 
Well, that will tend to differ depending on the personality that your spouse is, or maybe depending on where you have been strong at but weak at. Maybe your gift or your strength with your spouse has been giving them gifts. Oh, you give them all the gifts. They want roses, you give them roses. Doves, you drop the doves. You give them absolutely everything. But when it comes to quality time, you're just always running somewhere. And so loving them well, when that might look like I've got to create space in my week to love and serve my spouse. For some of you who are very hard-headed and bashing through the door all the time, loving your spouse might look like slowing down and maybe hearing more of what they have to say and factoring their opinion in the decision-making process. The irony is, though, is that for some of us, loving well might be feeling more emboldened and confident in sharing exactly what you're feeling in that moment and not cowering away in silence and, co- and constantly allowing yourself be run over. So as you see already, loving someone well can look very different in different situations and methods. Or, you know, being humble. What does true biblical humility look like? Is it always not sharing your opinion? Is it always giving in to the decisions of other people? Or does true humility, not humidity, humility look like standing up for something that you strongly believe the Lord has called you to stand on? Maybe sometimes being humble requires your voice being loud, bold, strong, with conviction. You see that with these instructions, the application of it sometimes differs in a myriad of ways. Well, I think the main one that we see here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, is fearing God. What does it look like to genuinely fear God? And so the, uh, we call him the prophet or the messenger or the teacher, if you will, in Ecclesiastes. He's given us some examples of what it might look like to fear God. And so what I want to do this morning is we're going to step through each of these verses. We're going to look at a clear instruction because it's full of clear instructions. We're going to look at why the writer gives this clear instruction. We're going to see the conclusion that the writer comes to on each of these different points. And then he's going to give us a good wisdom proverb to sit on, chew on, and allow digest for a little bit. So the first part is going to be us heads down looking in a text, running through. Then we're going to look at some themes, and then we're going to look at application. So look at verse one with me. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God to to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Now this first one is clear. What's the instruction? The instruction is that you should guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Now what's the reason behind that and the proverb? They're kind of dual joined together and it's this. Because to draw near to listen is better than sacrifices by fools. When I was in seminary, we were given this instruction in one of our practicums to go to specific styled churches or denomination of churches to see the manner in which they worship. And though in many ways, because there are different denominations in the Christian faith, there can be a temptation to think my denomination or my expression of my faith within the grounds, okay, within the grounds of believing that the Bible is the true ultimate authority, right? You can begin to think that your expression has it all together. It's this kind of exceptionalist, I'm using all these funny words today, forgive me. It's this exceptionalist mindset that I have it all together, we have thought it all out, and we have all the answers. And so the challenge by an older saint, one of my mentors, Dr. Alan Ross, told us, he said, look, instead, go there and see what you can learn. So one of the churches he instructed us to go to was Greek Orthodox Church. We have very few of them in Birmingham, but there's one in downtown that I happen to go to. So I'm going to this church, and as I get there, they said the service started at 8, y'all. But by the time I went to that door, there were people already in there. Now, it was so quiet, so at one point, I was like, maybe there's something wrong. Like, maybe there's a funeral service before the service starts, because there is something very dim and chill about this environment. But then as I began to walk in, I saw that it was not a spirit of misery, but a spirit of reverence. That many had already showed up at the service to begin preparing their hearts to encounter the Lord. And it convicted me. It convicted me because I think over time I began to see how I valued community, which is great and it's beautiful. It's so important that we encourage and see one another before the service starts. But we also have to live within this real tension of the God in whom we are going to go and encounter every Sunday morning. 
who were going to sing songs of worship and hear the word preached. What does it mean when you leave your home on a Sunday morning and are gathering with the saints? Yes, amen, hallelujah, but you are also about to encounter the creator of the entire universe, perfect and purely holy. There he is and you're going to meet him. Now, just to give you a cheat code before I even get to application, I don't have what this answer should specifically look like, but I do know that in the heart of every single believer, as we encounter and make time to meet with God, we must wrestle with the fact that, yes, we are meeting with a perfect, loving Abba, Father, Daddy, but we are also meeting with the creator of all things, pure and perfect in holiness, who does not tolerate sin and executes perfect judgment, yet we are coming to meet him. I'm going to jump a little bit ahead here, but how many times have you wrestled with that reality? A loving, loving father who sent his only son, but a holy father waging war against sin and darkness and will one day claim absolute authority and victory over this broken world. This is the God we serve. And this is the God we say we will come and meet every Sunday. All right, now the second instruction we hear, see here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We see it in verse 2 and 3, where it says this. It says, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. Why? Because God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. When I read this, and we're going to see this as a constant theme throughout this whole passage, one of the things we constantly see from the author is this challenge to the people who are reading. Why are your words so many? Why do you have so much to say? Especially when it comes to encountering our Lord. You see, when we acknowledge the Father as a gentle and loving shepherd who cares for us, which is good and appropriate truth, we must also, again, realize that we are also talking to a God who controls all things, and many a times his ways are higher than ours. No, all times his ways are higher than ours. So then that creates this situation for us, that we would probably do well to seek to listen more from him than it is to tell him what we think he should do in our lives. I found in my own time, now because I know this message is about to be real convicting, I'm just going to keep on putting myself on the butcher table. So you can see it as I'm dissecting my own heart, you should also dissect yours. There are so many times I encounter the Lord in prayer where I do not take a pause to listen to what he might be saying. No, Lord, I need this to happen. So while I'm praying to you, I am explaining every reason why this should happen this particular way in the way that I want. And the Lord is very gracious because during those times of prayer, he is prompting me with what the real problem is and what the real solution is. But here's what my sinful heart does. As he's prompting it, I'm like, then creating an answer as to why that can't be the case. Practical example. There's a brother or sister I have an issue with. Now in my heart, the Lord knows I should go talk to that person. The Lord knows I should have a discussion about that uncomfortable topic. And as I start to pray to the Lord about changing that person's heart, the Lord lays it on me. Well, maybe the Lord would use you in a posture of humility, love, and grace to have a discussion with that person and maybe reach a fruitful uh, conclusion. Now, as that is prompted in my heart, my sinful desire starts to do this with that truth. Yeah, but you see, if I do that, the person is not really going to listen. And so, God, what I'm really realizing at that same point is that it's no point me trying to talk to the person. You just have to do the miraculous work of chasing that person. I'm not going to be the person who's going to have the hard conversation. And if I had sat there, yes, making my petitions to the Lord, but then also taking time of solitude and reflection, I probably would have been able to ponder what the scriptures are saying as it relates to dealing with conflict. And as much as my flesh would not like a hard conversation, the scripture makes it clear that when you have an issue with a brother or a sister and they have sinned against you, you should go to them first and talk about it. If they don't listen or repent, then you should bring another person and go and try and talk about it. And if they don't listen and repent, then you should bring it before the leaders of the church. 
But many a times I'm so busy wanting God to hear what I have to say, very seldom do I make time for God to speak to me. In our times of studying scripture and our times of prayer, how many of us are making minutes and moments for silence and solitude? I fear that so many times the ability to spend time reflecting and listening to what the Lord might be saying is an overlooked aspect of our personal faith growth. We're all about listening to sermons. We're all about reflecting on the things said and studying scripture and doing word studies and understanding how this verb and noun might work. But very seldom do we create space in our times and our moments with the Lord where we are quiet and we are reflecting and we are listening to what he has to say. But what's even more interesting about this is the proverb that he gives in verse three. He says, dreams come with many cares and fools voices with many words. In the New Testament, we're gonna be jumping into James and we're gonna be learning even more and more again the danger that comes with many words. When we are always speaking, always having something to say, we are leaving very little time to listen and learn and understand, not only from God, but from his people and from others. And the beauty of wisdom literature is that it doesn't only apply within our spiritual journey. These are also really good advice to take in and apply in life with your relationships with other people. How good of a listener are you? Come back to that question later. Now, The third one, here the writer takes a little bit of a move. He changes his posture. It's in verse four, it says this. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow, for it is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Here the writer is talking about talking to the readers, which includes us, about the importance of our words being what they are. When we make a vow to the Lord to give or to do something, it is so much better that we follow through. Now, there can be different reasons why we do it. Maybe we're in a service where everybody's pledging certain amounts of money, and for some reason, you're like, man, I I can't be the only one who doesn't raise my hand. And so for that very reason, not a burden for the passion of seeing God's kingdom established, but instead a fear of man and the opinions of other people, you then make a vow to God. Now, what the author is trying to force us to recognize is that the words we say and the things we do mean something. And that in the life of every believer, the characteristic of consistency and integrity is something that we must indeed take serious. Of course, there is grace for when our humanity shows up and the brokenness of our world prevent us from following through with certain things. But the emphasis right now in this passage is that our yes should be yes and our no should be no. Let's look at the last instruction we see here. Verse six. Let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Get, hear this proverb. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. Now, I want us to look at certain themes that we see in this passage. The first one is that there is a clear challenge to be slower to speak and quicker to listen out of a reverence for God, which will in turn influence how we speak to others. We live in a world where there is an abundance of so-called platforms. Whether it's social media, Facebook, or Twitter, everybody wants to hear what you have to say, or we think that at least, hence why everybody's always saying something. Everybody is now an armchair expert in everything too. And for whatever reason you might feel justified in sharing all your opinions on absolutely everything, the habitus or the characteristic of a faithful follower of Jesus is yes, that we have opinions, but first we are eager and faithful in listening. Some of the most effective mentors I have had in my life have not spoken too much. They've just listened a lot. Sit down, hear what I'm saying, ask questions, probe, probe, probe. Why do you think this? Why do you think that? Okay, taking it in. And here's, what even, here's what's even more crazy about these mentors that I'm looking for wisdom for. They don't even give me an answer right there. What do they say? They say, you know what? Give me a few days, let me pray about it. 
Some of us are just way too quick to share what we think we know. And here's the thing. We saw it when we, in Proverbs, when we were studying. In fact, when I was preaching that last, one of the characteristics of a real mature believer is the fact that they are continually learning. That means even when you have established a certain confidence in how much you now know, there is still room for the Holy Spirit to chisel and refine that knowledge in a way that is more God-honoring and people encouraging and building. We must be a people who labor to listen and understand because in listening to God is growth and understanding and repentance, but in listening first and well to others, we begin to really understand what compassion and empathy looks like. If we're always speaking but rarely ever listening, we'll miss the people that are right in front of us and begin speaking to ideas or ourselves. Have you ever been in a moment like that? when you're weighed with different challenges or issues and you're trying to seek wisdom from somebody and you go to them and they give you a few seconds to share what's going on in your life and immediately they put you into a category. Oh, how dangerous categories can be. When instead of valuing the person you are ministering to, you are instead trying to connect it to something you've experienced. And so in that moment, whatever wisdom you now provide, you're really just giving it to a younger you instead of giving it to the person in front of you. You see, at Tapestry Church, our burden and mission is that we equip people for the work of ministry. So what that means is that it shows us to be faithful leaders and servants if you are washing one another's feet. So take this tool, let us all take this tool as we study this passage. May I grow in seeking to listen more to what God has to say before I run away with what I think I know. And let that apply in my small groups. Let that apply in my relationships. When someone has issues, when someone has problems, of course I might think I know that answer, but let me listen. I recently went bivocational. And as I've been working in my new establishment, there was this guy that I always met. His name was James. And I'm hoping one day he comes here. And I, he does the way he was, you know, just, I feel like he was always taking breaks and just kind of maybe taking the easy route sometimes. And I realized that there were certain habits he had that just made me, you know, look a little bit down on him. I'm confessing my sins. And I'm repenting right here. But there was a way I, I put him into a box. And I can never forget, I was taking trash out and, you know, It's fish guts all over the trash. Like, there's a different kind of stink with fish guts. That's all I'm saying. Like, once you smell that, you can tolerate and deal with anything else. It's different. But I'm there, I'm taking the trash out, and somehow he's just sitting down there. And I engage him in conversation. There are some habits he had, different kind of substances. You could tell that he had just recovered from. I've done a lot of ministry in that area. So I used to be able to look at someone and tell the drugs that they were struggling with or had been abusing. And so I'd put this guy in a category, but as we begin to talk and he began to share his problems, there was a temptation within me to immediately start giving him ways to find answers. And for some reason, as I've been battling with this passage, the Lord really pressed on my heart, and this isn't a word you should use all the time, but it said, shut up. Daniel, just mm, hold your mouth, keep quiet and listen. As I listened more and more, I began to hear with this guy. Everything I thought he needed to hear, he had already heard. And he already began applying and implementing in his life. And yeah, he had been in jail, done jail time. Yeah, he had been immoral and spent time around, but now he is married. Now he's faithfully serving in a celebrate recovery. Now he is dealing with those things and has even been offered a scholarship to go and study counseling. And so his answer, his question was not how do I deal with those things that I thought he already needed an answer to. No, instead it was, brother, how do I stay faithful? How do I keep fighting? And I left that conversation completely humbled for two reasons. Number one, I wanted him to ship him off into a cabinet, put a file tag on it and leave him. But then number two, I realized after leaving that conversation, had I not just listened, I would have missed a beautiful time to be encouraged. There are two main things I want us to hear from this sermon or message today. The first is that we should be slower to speak and quicker to listen. But the second thing is fearing God in all things. I mean, it's throughout the passage 
Yes, we are meant to be slower to speak to God and to others, but there is a real fear of God that is meant to reside on the heart of a believer. Now, that fear can be very controversial for many of us. When we hear fear, we all have different understandings of what fear might look like. I went to boarding school, and boarding school, they flogged you if misbehaved. That was fear that kept me in line. So when I hear words like fear, I'm like, there's no, there's no element of joy there. It's shiver in my boots, and I want to hide away and do everything I can to avoid repercussions for my actions. But a better understanding of that fear is respect. That is, the believer is meant to live a life where we are constantly conscious of the fact that there is a God that we love who has saved us and who is superintending and loving and watching our every move. What does it look like in our lives today to be conscious of the fact that God is here? When there's no one else around and you, your ethics, your character, your integrity is being tested, what Does it look like to fear God? Well, it is the constant remembrance that my Father is here with me. When you think no one can see what is going on in your life, your commitments or your vows to him, the the writer here is saying, no, the fact that God is here is more important than everybody else being around physically and watching you. It doesn't matter about the humans. It matters more importantly that God is your audience. How are we operating? How are we living? Are we overwhelmed by the fact that God is here? Are we just overwhelmed by the fact that we want to make people happy? We want to impress them. We, we, We want their approval. We want to be accepted by them. Let's look at some applications. So I have three main applications, and I'm going to run through them quite quickly. The first in that is that in God's presence, are we listening or are we talking? We've already spoken about that. It is so important that we spend time to reflect. The second is our vows. Are we fulfilling them? And are they a product of us being burdened by the mission of God? We just finished Pray, Give, Go. How many of us were impacted by the different stories and partners that we work with? Has the Lord laid on your heart a desire to support or to champion those missions? Go for it. Go after it. And then the last one, again, is fearing God. How God conscious are we? Are we aware that he's here? Are we aware that he is present? And how is that affecting the words that we say to each other, the words that we say to God, and the vows that we make to him? I'm gonna end with this thought. It is easier to be more conscious of God, present and aware in our lives, when we constantly remember what he has done for us. When we live lives that are absent of a fear of God, it's probably because we are also living lives that are absent of constantly remembering the good news of Jesus Christ. There's always that correlation. Because when we remember that a perfect and holy God saw broken and messed up sinners, deserving of his wrath and judgment, and instead of giving them wrath, eternal damnation. He gave us eternal life, strength, love, turned us from wretched orphans into sons and daughters who are now heirs in kingdom. Of course, we will desire to live lives that live in honor of him. So my challenge this morning is remember. Remember what our loving father has done for us. And that was what will fuel us to live lives that we're committed in word, speech, and deed, and we truly, truly fear him in the most perfect, holy, and respectful of ways. And there is grace for when we fall short, but we will continue to pursue that obedience. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you because it is filled with instruction and wisdom that we can take and apply in our daily lives. Father, first of all, we ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness in the areas of our lives that we have failed. We have failed to live conscious of your presence in all and everything we do and places we are, in the words that we say and the things that we don't say. Lord, I pray that you'll help us, you'll grow us as individuals and as a community to be more aware of your presence, to live more in a reverence of who you are that when we encounter one another and we come to worship you as a community here or even in our homes, when we step into the presence of our Lord to pray and hear and study your word, may it be cloaked with a reverence for you. 
I pray, Lord, that we will be a people who are slow to speak, but quicker to listen. That we would be eager to hear what you have to say to us. That we would minister and serve our fellow brothers and sisters well. Eager to hear what they have to say instead of eager to hear our own voices as we attempt to show our our prowess, our ability, our exceptionalism in dealing with other people's situations. Continue to build us up in love. A love for God, but a love also for your people. I pray, Lord, that you will lay upon us burdens. Burdens to see your kingdom grow and your name magnified in a myriad of ways. That we will be people that make vows to you and keep those vows. Help us, O Lord, to grow in obedience in all these things. But most importantly, help us to remember. Help us to always remember the eternal life that came at such a cost that has been bestowed upon us. And help us to live in that confidence, in that power, in that freedom, and in that redemption. We love you, Lord, and we ask all this in your name. Amen.